Good afternoon and welcome to this book at lunchtime event on Royals and Rebels, The Rise and Fall of the Sikh Empire, written by Dr. Priya Atwal. My name is Professor Wes Williams and I'm the director here at Torch. Book at lunchtime, as regulars will know, is Torch's flagship interdisciplinary event series, taking the form of fortnightly bite-sized book discussions with a range of commentators. In different times, we would have been able to offer you lunch as well as food for thought. But of course, one of the positives of these times is that we can gather together in online space from all around the world. And in the various sessions this term, we will be traveling adventurously, widely, and I hope wisely too. So do please, please take a look at our website and newsletter for the full program this term. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Priya Atwell to speak about her book. Also on the panel are Professor Polly O'Hanlon and Professor Faisal Devji, who will be chairing the discussion. In a moment, I will hand over to Professor Devji, who will introduce both the book and the rest of the panel. This will be followed by a brief reading by Priya herself. Afterwards, our commentators will present their thoughts on the book, coming at it from their particular disciplines. We'll then give Priya the chance to respond to some of the points raised before entering into what promises to be a fascinating discussion for the last quarter of an hour or so. The event will then, so the last quarter of an hour or so, will be then be concluded with questions from you, the audience. All that's left for me to do then is to thank you for coming and to introduce our chair. Professor Faisal Devji is a professor of Indian history and the director of the Asian Studies Center here at Oxford. His research focuses on political thought in modern South Asia and is more broadly concerned with ethics and violence in this globalized world. He's the author of four books, most recently, Muslim Zion, Pakistan as a Political Idea. He's a fellow at New York University's Institute of Public Knowledge and was formerly Yves Otraman Chair at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. We're enormously delighted and privileged to have you here with us and I'd like to hand over to you now to chair the rest of the session. I'll return for the questions towards the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wes. It really is a, a pleasure to be here to celebrate uh, this wonderful book, which is substantial not only in content, but also has a rather handsome cover published by Hearst and Co. here in London. Um, let me say a few words about uh, Priya and Polly and then turn over to Priya to um, uh, tell us more about her book. So Priya Atwal is a historian of empire, monarchy and cultural politics across Britain and South Asia. She has taught history at King's College London and at Oxford, where she was also a student. We remember her well, uh, a student not so long ago, I might add. Uh, her research has been featured in collaborative projects with historic royal palaces, among others, and she makes regular broadcast appearances, most recently uh, presenting a BBC Radio 4 series, Lies My Teacher Told Me. I hope none of those lies were from here, uh, Priya. Um, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> uh, and the, as, as commentator, we have Professor Polly O'Hanlon, who is Professor of Indian History and Culture at Oxford, um, and her research interests focus on the social and intellectual history of India. Her most recent book was At the Edges of Empire, Essays in the Social and Intellectual History of India, which explores new approaches to questions about caste, gender, and religious cultures across a range of historical environments. Uh, so with that, perhaps, uh, Priya, um, you can tell us something about your book, and then Polly and I will return to discuss it with you. Yeah, thank you very much, Faisal, for that very kind introduction. Um, I've got a copy of the book here, so I'll do a quick reading as um, uh, promised. I hope everyone can hear me okay with the book in front of me like this. Um, so yeah, I'll just dive in. I'm going to read a section from the conclusion. Um, so here we go. For many Punjabi families, this little couplet has long been a folk favourite. Iksi Raja, Iksi Rani. Dono Marge Khatam Kahani. Translated into English, this means once there was a king and a queen, they both died. End of story. I could leave it there technically, couldn't I? But um, yeah, I don't think Faisal and Polly would have been too happy if that had been the, the whole season. Um, it's an irreverent quip that most likely stems from the folk tales about fictional royalty 
that have been passed down between generations throughout India over the course of many centuries. My own dad never tired of repeating this joke to my brother and me while we were growing up, though it does get more annoying when you're a bit older and trying to write an actual book about royalty. There is no doubt that we've seen a lot of kings, queens and princes dying during the course of this book, some under especially brutal and unforgettable circumstances. Just as Guru Nanak preached, not even the most powerful and wealthy kings can cheat death. But their deaths only ended their own stories. What the preceding pages have taught us is that, contrary to what has been assumed for so long, royal deaths alone did not end the Sikh Empire, not even that of the Lion of Punjab, Ranjit Singh. As a kingdom, the Sikh Empire was wiped off the map 170 years ago, but it left behind a significant legacy, not only in terms of shaping politics and culture in the region of Punjab, but also as a lasting imprint on popular memory which of course has its most prominent resonance in Maharaja Ranjit Singh's role as a national hero for many Sikhs and Punjabis to this day. Yet only by equally resurrecting the story of both the Raja and the Rani, or more accurately, the many Ranis, can we truly and deeply understand the inner world of the Sikh Empire. It has been an exciting challenge to ask new critical questions and explore alternative sources about this extraordinary period and reign and to open up new perspectives on how the men, women and children of the Punjabi royal elite went about constructing a new kingdom in the late 18th and 19th centuries. Whether it was Sadhak Gaur helping out Ranjit Singh on the battlefield, Gadak Singh hugging the British in a diplomatic gesture, Mind again commissioning works of art for her royal apartments, or Nanihal Singh getting married and having children, to mention just a few aspects of their busy and colourful lives. The historical footprints left behind by Ranjit Singh's parents, aunts, uncles, in-laws, wives, children and grandchildren deserve to take their place in history. That history alone should not be limited to the story of one great man alone, um, no matter how talented he might have been. Beyond these leading figures of Ranjit Singh's dynasty, we have also uncovered the involving dynamics of the wider royal world around them, particularly how perceptions of individual monarchs, as well as ideas about kingship more generally, ebbed and flowed with each passing generation of subjects. Even when entire monarchies or dynasties are removed from the scene, the influence and symbolic power of royal culture still lingers on, taking new forms in accordance with changing circumstances and interests. Across several centuries of Punjabi history, we have encountered in this book all sorts of debates around who could legitimately rule and what it meant to be royal. From the revolutionary royalism of the Khalsa, founded by Guru Gobind Singh in 1699, to Maharani Chandgore's battles with Prince Shir Singh over the rights of women to rule in 1840, and then again in the new style of colonial government and ceremonial royal culture forced upon Maharani Jindgore and young Dilip Singh by the British after 1846. The process of looking anew and with more curiosity at these characters and ideas in turn compels us to come to a very different understanding and appreciation of history writing itself whether on the subject of the Sikh Empire or on the evolving role and status of royalty more generally. We may never have all the answers about lingering questions or controversies in the history. And of course, our own reflections on the past will always be coloured by our contemporary concerns and biases. However, by at least questioning the hagiography, misogyny and orientalism that have infused the dominant narratives about this fascinating kingdom and its society, and by unravelling how these have coloured our perceptions, I think it's fair to say that we not only reach a more a richer, more insightful understanding of what really contributes to the rise and fall of this empire, but also in a broader sense, we can more fully appreciate what this history has meant to generations of people interested in its fate, as well as the continual evolution of the narratives constructed around it by the political, by political, cultural and scholarly observers to this day. I'll leave it there and hand back over to Faison Polly. Thank you very much, uh, Priya. I just thought I'd say a few words before handing it over to Polly. Uh, and uh, I expect Polly will have uh, a great deal to say about um, the substance of your uh, argument because it falls uh, you know, centrally in her field of research, uh, the sort of early years, if you will, of the East India Company. Uh, but I want to begin at the end of your book, in a way, and, and, and think about the afterlife of the story of Sikh royalty that, uh, that you're telling us. And I'm reminded of um, uh, a writer from the early 20th century, a British writer, Buckler, whom you and I have discussed before, Priya, uh, who already in the 1920s had this really interesting uh, 
um, comparison to make. He sees what's happening with the transfer of power, uh, not the transfer of power in 1947, but the transfer of power in 1857, 1858, uh, during the mutiny, uh, as being not simply that between India and Britain, uh, but also uh, between a royal order uh, on the one hand and a new corporate order run by uh, the East India Company and parliament and, and uh, democracy, if you will, in England itself. Uh, and you will recall Priya, he makes this argument about how um, uh, what happens in the mutiny, what happens in that penultimate moment of British conquest, the conquest of India, uh, is that two royal orders are under threat by the company and all that it represents, uh, the new corporate industrial power uh, linked uh, to parliament and to democracy. Uh, uh, and in India, the royal houses, the Mughal Empire in particular, go or are subordinated totally, whereas in England, uh, the royal family and the royal house, uh, which had also been more or less under attack, uh, notionally, uh, if not physically, uh, by these corporate powers, is preserved to live another day in a kind of attenuated symbolic mode. Uh, so I'm just interested in the parallelisms that your book sets up between, as it were, these two royal houses um, at the very end of your book. Uh, uh, is it possible, I wanted to see a kind of curious alliance emerging uh, between Indian royalty on the one hand, if we can use that term at all, and the British royal family on the other, given the afterlife of Maharaja Dalip Singh in England. Uh, so, you know, that's one question that I have. The other, of course, has to do with a really central subject in your book, uh, that is to say the role of women uh, in these struggles. Uh, and we tend often to think of, as it were, matriarchal, again, I use that word in heavy quotation marks, uh, that matriarchal forms of authority um, uh, are older uh, and uh, fade away in modern times. But both the story of the Sikh Empire and Maharani Jan Kaur in particular, and the British Empire with Queen Victoria as its notional head, are really the stories of the reemergence in a completely new way of the power of women, symbolic or otherwise. Uh, so. That's another question that I'd like you to um, perhaps address. You know, how are these, uh, uh, what kind of link exists uh, between, apart from a personal link, uh, between, as it were, these two mother figures, uh, Maharani Jankar on the one hand and Queen Victoria on the other, with Maharaja Dalip Singh as, the, as it were, the son torn between them both. So now I know your book doesn't discuss uh, Queen Victoria and that part of Maharaja Dilip Singh's career, uh, but I thought it might be um, interesting for the audience to hear about as sort of the afterlife of the empire that you, uh, that you describe so well um, in your book. Uh, so with those few words, uh, let me turn to Polly. Um, uh, Polly, if you have any comments to make. Thank you very much, uh, Faisal. Um, and uh, Priya, um, thank you so much for asking me to be part of this wonderful occasion. Um, having followed Priya's work now over many years, it's so very pleasing to see it emerging in this absolutely outstanding book. Um, well, there is so much here to fascinate, uh, to provoke, to enjoy um, uh, and to look at. Um, Amongst the many achievements of the book, um, uh, I'll mention just a few that I, I particularly appreciated. Um, first, um, I guess, is the expansion in our understanding of Mughal, Persianate, Timurid models of kingship as providing a model for emulation, not just across India's lesser royal courts, but also for major religious and sectarian traditions in the hybrid royal culture that was developed first by some of the Sikh gurus, which blended then with the egalitarian Sikh emphases on the spiritual 
authority uh, of the Khalsa. There are many other, um, in, in my own research, I've come across many other pre-colonial sectarian traditions of which this was true, um, leading sannyasis of 17th century Benares um, also held, as it were, royal courts. Um, uh, and so I think this um, uh, important interplay between cultures of royalty and the realm of the spiritual um, it is a, a wonderful new field for investigation um, and, and particularly because it brings in a whole set of other important issues, questions about the inc incorporation through robing, questions about, about the body, uh, the body politic, the body spiritual, uh, the body material. So um, uh, models, of, models of kingship, I think, is one uh, really important contribution of the book. Second, it's worth emphasizing the book's contribution to um, a new global history of cultures of royalty and the imperial networks along which ideas, practices, and often aspirant local rulers traveled during the heyday uh, of empire. Traveled in order to associate themselves with those cultures and the practices and relationships that sustained it. We're used to thinking about global networks and the spread of political and anti-colonial ideologies. So it's very useful to be reminded that these were also pathways for the consolidation of institutions of royalty uh, during the, the high noon of empire. There's also um, new light, of course, on the importance of marriage and the household as key institutions at the heart of Indian political life. So ably demonstrated by what Priya has done to recover the extraordinary degree of agency that elite women of the Sikh court were able to wield in the making of Ranjit Singh's empire and then to protect it against British attempts to isolate Sikh royal women um, and to curb their power. Um, and it's what's remarkable, of course, um, and again so well illustrated in the book, um, that this female agency extended beyond the negotiation of marriage alliances, the management of the household, um, uh, extended um, also to the management of key financial and military resources. And perhaps the last thing I'd like to um, emphasize that is so enjoyable about this book are the illustrations. Uh, Priya has um, by hook or by crook, using, using methods we shouldn't inquire into perhaps, um, Priya has assembled a fabulous set of colour illustrations for the book, um, uh, right back from the early illustrations that I certainly haven't seen before, the early Sikh gurus, all the way through to images of the Sikh household uh, and women um, in the middle of, and later part of the 19th century. And what is to me so fascinating about these images is that the, the Sikh royal women uh, in the sort of collective portraits of the women are individualized, or at least they seem to me to be individualized in a way that isn't really very often true of, um, of other depictions of, um, of Indian royal households where women are there, but they're there just as it were as female figures and, and that no attempt really to made to individualize them. Now it would be very interesting to hear from Priya a little bit about how she went about assembling this extraordinary collection um, of images. So really um, uh, there are many questions I'd like to ask but perhaps one, one in particular I'd like um, to leave you with um, and that is about this question of female agency. Um, does this degree of female agency develop really because of the unique circumstances of the late 18th century in North India? Um, that at this particular point in the history of Punjab, marriage strategies offered a uniquely advantageous way forward um, in the consolidation of Sukhachakian dynastic power. Is, it, is female agency here to do with this particular period? Or, um, or and, should we also look at um, Sikh tradition with its very egalitarian emphases uh, in its understanding of, of men and women uh, Sikh uh, devotees? Are there things there that also 
um, provide a, a, a congenial environment for the female um, exercise um, of power. Or, um, and uh, as a third possibility, have we simply underestimated the scope for royal agency in India's history? India's um, uh, history here often gets a bad press uh, as a history which shows political institutions, family institutions as antipathetic to the um, exercise of female power. Um, and in fact, that's really not the case, that there may be many other Mainakins and Jin Kars out there for us to discover. That in fact, India's cultures of gender were, were and in a sense, um, still are remarkably amenable to the exercise of female power. But so long as that female power is contained within and directed towards um, the power of the family. Um, uh, so those are some of the questions that came to mind as I, as I read through uh, this book and marveled at how it's, how it's developed and blossomed really um, uh, since, uh, uh, since I first saw it as an undergraduate dissertation. Um, and um, all congratulations uh, for, uh, to Priya for her, her, her stamina, her imagination, her sense, her vision, early vision of what this uh, project uh, could become. So many congratulations to, uh, to our uh, good friend uh, Priya and I will hand back now to Faisal. Thank you very much, uh, Polly. Um, Priya, um, any initial responses and then we can have a little discussion. Um, yeah, plenty to go on there. I mean, firstly, I just want to formally say a big thank you to both uh, you, Faisal and Polly for, I mean, obviously you referenced that I was your student and everything, but it's, and I think just from the sheer richness of the questions that you just asked me and the comments that were raised will show just how great my supervision was all the way through <laughs> through my studies and how that helped with the development of the book. Um, I mean, I have lots to say in response to the comments, but I mean, do you, I don't know, should we, should I, do you want me to give, go into that or should we, you know, because I, I think there's a lot of overlap actually between what yeah. you both said. So I can briefly um, sum up some thoughts. Um, I'll start with the easiest question first. Polly, I promise there was nothing dodgy that went on with my <laughs> accumulation of the <laughs> <end machine. Yes. laughs> it, was, it was a combination of luck and kindness from other people, really, in many ways, coming forward. I mean, um, the photographs of Shekhapura Fort were a real boon, and they were already published on um, a website, AsianArchitecture.com, or also known as OrientalArchitecture.com. And that happened, I happened to stumble across those as a Google find. Um, and then I got in touch with Alan Ali, the photographer. And it, those are incredibly precious because yeah. now Shekhapura Fort is not accessible, hasn't been for many years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those beautiful frescoes of mine again, Savili, her, her royal apartments are now, you know, just crumbling away. Sure. Um, the samurai collection, that was through some, a, a friend of mine, Peter Singh Bantz, who's a collector, who, who introduced me to um, the samurai family. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea <laughs> prior to, you know, writing the first draft of the manuscript of the book that these paintings even existed. Um, I mean, I was aware of the collections, of course, in the V&A and the Royal Collection and others. Mm -hmm. um, and those were absolutely integral to my, well, attempts to understand the Royal culture. And I mean, that was something that Faisal and I talked about as I was developing the PhD thesis, that the visual mm -hmm. artefacts of this are going to be incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And... And that obviously opens up a different side to the history of this period compared to what you get, for example, in the Persian Chronicles or in the Sikh texts of that, the Rethlami or um, the Sikh histories of that period. The material culture really does show you how that royal culture works. Mm. And, you know, you see Ranjit Singh depicted with a halo or with a Shatri over his head. And you see the Maharani's, you know, giving, you know, acting as patrons in, in, a, in a very you know, Mughal style over informally Mughal thought. So mm. I think that really helped me to bring it to life. But what you think, I mean, there's a point to be made here, actually, that there's a growing uh, culture of collecting mm. amongst Sikhs and Punjabis themselves. Mm. And I think, and, and they're kind of almost um, resurrecting in some ways the practices that Ranjit Singh and others would have followed themselves mm. of trying to collect the manuscripts and trying to collect the artwork and even the objects. Mm. Um, 
and I hope that those collections are made more accessible and fairly open to scholars and students and everybody else going forward because you know that that helps you move away actually from an over dependence on the colo particularly the colonial records of that period and what's in the British Library and that kind of thing and I think that hopefully that's only going to continue to grow um I mean I'm going to connect up the other two questions the big questions that you both asked about royal cultures uh based on what you referenced with Buckler and um the kind of models of kingship um, that you mentioned, uh, Polly. I mean, I think what we're, I guess what we're trying, what I was trying to show is, is very much building on mm. this growing historiography, um, an incredibly rich historiography that, that of course, Polly, you've contributed to, um, that, that actually takes these kind of royal courts and these kingdoms seriously. And I mean, if anything, what Ranjit Singh does then is perhaps not that original in, in many respects. He's building on so many layers of, you know, experiments that previous Indian monarchs had done. And of course, it's not to say that the Mughals themselves, he obviously heavily borrows from, from Mughal ideas as the gurus had done, but plays with them and subverts with them and experiments. And I mean, it, it's part and parcel of what the Mughals themselves had done, of course, from Barbara's time through to Upper and, and beyond. Um, that this was a continually fluid, thing. And I think going back to what Faisal was saying is that it's an incredibly powerful and incredibly rich political and cultural tradition that even post-1858, um, you know, the company does itself take on some of these trappings of royalty. And I think that was what I was trying to show in the diplomacy chapter of the book, that, you know, the, the company is somewhat out, right? It's not in the kinship networks. It's not in the normal dynamics of Indian political culture in that same degree. But there, there's interesting how Ranjit Singh tries to bring in Wade, tries to bring in Lord Bentick and Lord Auckland and others and, and incorporate, and they're open to this, but there's these blurry boundaries between, you know, how they're representing themselves back in Britain and as Buckley rightly points that out versus in India. And, I think this was the interesting point that you mentioned is, can we actually talk about Indian royalty as a group? I mean, and, the, and obviously later on you have the princely states and everything else. I think British imperialism brings them all together into one cluster. It's not to say that they were ever one homogenous or one united group. And of course you don't, you see that explicitly in the rise of Ranjit Singh in how he sides with the company against the Marathas and against the Nepalese and all sorts of others, even other Punjabi Rajas. Um, so I think there's lots there that, you know, we, we tend to think, but I think actually, yeah, the presence of the company does help to, well, I think in, in Ranjit Singh's time, it draws, you know, it's another player that's in the region and it's, you know, and, and they're pitting against Ranjit Singh allies with the company in order to boost his own rise. But perhaps later on, I mean, the Leap Singh himself in later on in his rebellion, um, I'm jumping ahead, actually. I know you were referencing Queen Victoria, but later on in his life, at the very end of his life, he tries to hark back and he tries to build an alliance of Indian royals against the British Raj. And I mean, even against Queen Victoria because he's upset with her by that point, but he still maintains this royal identity. He goes to the Tsar of Russia or he goes to Victoria's daughter, who was by then, um, you know, the queen of, of in, in, uh, in Prussia. Um, and of the, of the growing German empire. So he constantly looks, and I think that's, that's important to recognize that there is this royal identity that's entrenched, but then it becomes increasingly fluid over time. And very briefly on the queen, um, I mean, Polly, you asked me whether this was particularly about the 18th century. I don't know if I gave a false impression in the book, and I think the more I've been reading since it's come out, the more I'm like, no, it's, you know, I mean, even within the Mughal dynasty, mm. Barber was reliant on his mother and his mother, his mother, you know, his, his in-law families, um, his grandmother, his aunts, to, to shore up his authority when he was in tricky straits himself. And he, of course, and Akbar themselves, you know, all come to the power at a very young age in many, a similar way to Ranjit Singh himself when he inherits the Sardarship from his father and Dilip Singh when he inherits the throne or was placed on the throne um, in 1843. So there's nothing, I mean, and I think that's that's the frustrating thing about the kind of gender history of this period is that it's 
you know, you either see women's agency being thoroughly tarnished by men like Henry, Henry Lawrence and the, you know, the East India Company and, and not understanding the role that women play, but also a kind of a covering up of the, the fluidity of, of gender relations, as you as you rightly mentioned, Polly, and as I drew inspiration on for the book, um, that there weren't these hard and fast divides between what men and women were supposed to do in terms of political roles. Mm. And women could step in and take very important positions. But I think, yes, it was there was a caveat that it had to be towards the family or towards the wider cause. There were issues with women withholding power within their, you know, in their own right, in their own stead. Mm -hmm. And I think, yes, within the kind of more egalitarian culture of Sikhi that Guru Nanak gives women equal status. And then Guru Gobind Singh, of course, equally enables women to be initiated within the Khalsa. And you have female warriors like Mai Bhago and others that are you know, very prominent in that kind of post Guru Gobind Singh era, um, which of course sets the tone for women like Sadakor or Jindgore to be leading armies and, and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, but do I think it's something particular to that period? Really, no. Mm. Um, but then I think what you see, you know, linking back quickly to Faisal's question about the Victoria Jindgore, you know, the Leap Singh mother triangle, um, which was the very beginnings of the thesis, actually, the PhD. Um, I think what you see in the kind of history writing or, or in, in terms of the political rhetoric that emerges when you take one mother figure out, one queen figure out, the Indian one, and you put Victoria in, is a kind of suppression or a disintegration of what that female agency and what those more, you know, interesting gender relations in terms of the politics and culture had represented. And it's not to say that the company in any way was comfortable with Queen Victoria's own role. They didn't like her intervening and speaking up on behalf of the Leap Singh and, for example, asking for a better political settlement or financial settlement for him after he loses his kingdom. Um, but Victoria butts in. So I think it all, it's all part and parcel of this puzzle of not only female agency, but royal agency. <laughs> and um, yeah. I'll leave it there for now because I want to respond, but there's so many things there. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Priya. You know, I just thought that, um, again, picking up on, you know, Polly's um, question about uh, periodization, um, that, you know, you could write, um, and, and, you know, putting that question along with mine about, you know, how can you see this as a global story as well? Uh, you know that the, there is a global story that is there to be told about um, not necessarily gender history, yeah. uh, but the way in which you can see uh, hitherto, uh, um, uh, you know, entirely masculinized uh, narratives about power and dynasty, completely differently when you look at them through the lens of gender. Um, and, and how those changes occur uh, across the world, or at least in this case, uh, both in, in, in Western Europe and in, in India, in Northern India, uh, with some connect filaments of connection between the two, uh, which is why the you know, Queen Victoria Jind Kaur thing becomes interesting. But you know, I also thought that from the, you know, when you look at the last moment, if you will, the last gasp of Indian aristocratic power, the mutiny, which I mentioned before, there you see this extraordinary efflorescence of women leaders, uh, as if we were back in the 18th century, if not earlier. Uh, you have Hazrat Mahal, of course, and you have the Rani of Jhansi. Uh, and these are famous characters in their own time. They don't have to be recovered. Uh, you know, they've, since their time, they've been at the forefront of Indian and indeed British narratives about uh, these events. And I think that's, you know, the ambiguity there is actually really startling because, you know, going back to Polly, it's like, do you see this as a kind of a, a moment of emergence or do you see this as a last gasp or do you see this as a moment of departure that's, you know, there is a future in there as well, a story that's being told. And in a way, you know, is that not also the problem, um, you know, whether this is a starting point or an end point or a midpoint um, that can be told about, um, the making of Sikh identity itself, uh, you know, as it transitions from, if you will, a Republican form to a monarchical form to something altogether different. Uh, 
but carrying all that baggage with it. Uh, I don't know, Polly, if you have any um, anything to add there. Uh, well, I, I suppose uh, what I was thinking was um, uh, the, the moment here for me is um, looking at these different cultures of gender um, amongst elite women, um, amongst aristocratic houses in in 19th century Britain and in 19th, uh, early 19th century India. And it's not the case that, so, you know, when we see, um, you know, this, this kind of very strong patriarchal assertion, um, uh, dr drive to control the power of Indian royal women, which comes out uh, across the board in India in the, from the middle of the 19th century, the idea that, you know, Indian princes have to be sent away to boarding school so they can be removed from the malign influence of the Zanana and so on. Um, uh, I think it's, um, I think that female agency there is not the casualty necessarily of British aristocratic culture, because if you look at um, British aristocratic society at most periods in the 19th century, you will see similar forms of female agency. Female agency there is really the casualty of empire. Um, it's the casualty of, of, of the fact that um, uh, if you're looking at female agency within a, an aristocratic or a royal household, you can negotiate uh, with it, you can control it, you can channel it, um, you can allow it some freedom of manoeuvre. But, but uh, from the point of view of, of um, uh, East India Company and then later uh, Government of India um, officials, these forms of female power were nothing but malign because they couldn't be controlled. They didn't have um, the, uh, the, the, the family connections, the cultural understanding, you know, all the shared political goals that operated if you were looking at female agency within, within, within a royal family. So it's really empire rather than, as it were, aspects of British metropolitan culture that really, I think, um, are, are the, uh, do so much to erode um, female agency in India. Um, in the in the high noon of empire, but that would be my sense of things. Um, uh. Priya, any? Yeah, I mean, I I couldn't agree more, and I think, um, and you really see that. You really see that in the exchanges that Victoria has with Yuvip Singh about his, you know, his next steps of his life, um, and you see that in her interactions with Dalhousie, the, you know, the the last Governor General of the East India Company. Um, that there is, you know, that the royals see this as a fundamentally dynastic enterprise and that keeping the dynasty in their position is the most important thing. And keeping that over and above what's happening with the development of your country, you know, as a democracy or as a nation state or as an empire or whatever is the most important thing. Um, and I think it's interesting, you know, when, you, when I read the letters between Dalhousie and Victoria, that is equally irked by her involvement, her attempts to interfere and insert herself within Indian politics and Dilip Singh's settlement, as he was, you know, to, to quickly, as quickly as possible, get rid of others or get rid of the Mughals and that kind of stuff. And I think you can absolutely see this as part of the puzzle. And I think then the gender aspect is one important strand of all of this. Mm. And that if you, I mean, but it's a strand that's kind of been neglected for far too long, I would say. And, and by leaving that out, you're actually missing an important dimension of how this politics worked, how this culture worked. Mm. And, um, and actually, then you're right, absolutely what's shared in a global sense. Um, so I think in terms of the, the sick aspect of it is, is, is complicated, I think. And, and that's what I was trying to do in the first chapter of the book is to flesh out, well, how much of this is sick ideology? And how much of this is royal culture? And actually, where did the two meet and, and kind of blend in this sort of fluid way? Because that's something that clearly Ranjit Singh and then later on, you know, the other members of his family and then the Leap Singh as a rebel Maharaja later, they, they, they engage with that identity in a fluid way and in a sometimes quite convenient way to suit whatever their interests or positions are at the time, in, in, you know, throughout the 19th century. And... Um, I think that's something that I as a Sikh had to come to terms with as a court because you look at these figures as heroes right that mm. actually there's there's a lot more going on with this um and that 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 contributes to the sort of Sikh national mythology around these characters and what they represent too 
So there's lots of strands. Of course, Sikh identity undergoes all sorts of changes then again under colonial rule. Um, and then how these figures are represented, of course, changes too. Um, but if you, yeah, I think, 80, and then you really see that with, with what happens in Dilip Singh's own education in the last few years of his reign that leading up to 1857, 58 is an important turning point. And then the position that Jindagore occupies is in many ways that kind of last gasp of, yeah. you know, yeah. of, of female royal power. Mm -hmm. could, could I pitch in with another question? Is it time to, yes, of course. Uh, to do that? Um, uh, you talked, um, Priya, um, about the degree to which, you know, the, these aspects of royal culture um, are, are, are relatively neglected. Um, and of course, um, in, in all kinds of ways, our perspectives these days are on histories from below, subaltern studies, um, uh, as it were, um, anti-colonial movements and so on. And, and that may be part of, so, so kind of royal history is has been a kind of unfashionable um, uh, area to, to research. Um, and what I uh, would like your thoughts on, uh, really something to do with, with something that's there in the book, it's kind of lurking everywhere in the book, and that is the theatre of royalty. Of course, you know, royalty, a royal court is a theatre, and theatres have audiences, and audiences not just um, amongst the courtiers, but amongst wider um, communities of warriors, of, of petty soldats, um, and of their own uh, dependents and, and networks of, um, of clients. Um, and um, I'm thinking of a, a, a historian um, uh, I know in India at the moment who's researching um, uh, the way in which images of Queen Victoria um, informed the, the political radicalism of Dalit communities in um, in mid 19th century uh, Bombay, um, that, that, you know, that there were all of these um, uh, conservative social and political hierarchies, whether on the British or the Indian side, but that somewhere there was an untainted beneficent principle of royalty, which if only they could, uh, if only uh, Dalits could, uh, could engage with that principle, many of their difficulties would find a solution. And, and so I suppose what I'd like to, to hear your thoughts on is how you can bring uh, your history to engage with, with wider popular histories and particularly popular audiences for royalty uh, in the colonial period. I don't know whether that's something that, well, I know it's something that you think about, but if, if you have anything you'd like to say. Um, I think it's becoming an increasingly important question, Polly, and I've, I've also taken some inspiration um, from the work of someone like Melinda Banerjee, for example, who's mm. looked at this in his, the, his book, Mortal God, um, and looked at Bengali, um, so Bolton, you know, assimilation of ideas of monarchy and royal, um, royal trappings, in a way, to assert their own sense of sovereignty and agency. And I mean, you can see that in the Sikh tradition, of course, as well. And, and what I talked about in the book about, and I, I mean, I wasn't, that wasn't my own research. I was leveraging the ideas of Louis Fennec and others, but about Guru Gobind Singh's revolutionary royalism. The mm. idea that you're not, you know, I'm not saying that Guru Gobind Singh in any way was predicting the rise of Ranjit Singh. If anything, he was diffusing royal agency across the entire community. Mm. And so I think that's what I was trying to make the point with the book is that Monarchy is a trope, or, or as you said, a form of theatre, a, a performance of power, mm. um, and as a form of symbolism, if not an actual king, is mm. so imbued within the culture of the political culture of the subcontinent mm. that you see it cropping up in so many ways. And mm. I mean, that's even behind the joke that I, you know, with the conclusion, Ixirata, Ixirani, you know, that kind of story. Um, it pops up in so many different angles. And I think in terms of a conception of power, I think it's important that we do and that we are, you know, I mean, going back to, I've just been finished reading Richard Eaton's um, India's Persian Age. And that of course looks at how um, royal ideas of royalty and ideas of sovereignty are continually being adapted, you know, in so many different contexts throughout the history of the Indian subcontinent. And so for that reason, I think it's helpful to make the study of royalty rational again, if only to understand the terms in which that power operated. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, and also then, because it's not not entirely unique to India, of course, it's again connects back to this idea of the global history that we've been talking about. You know, Central Asian ideas and and Safavid Iranian and everything else. You know, all these different um, ideologies are constantly you know, whirling through the subcontinent. And when you bring the colonial stuff into it, the British um, East India Company, um, it adds another layer. But of course, it's not to say the East India Company didn't succeed in, they didn't succeed in entirely imposing a new order, did they? Um, the Indian royal aspect very much fused with it or, or wasn't, you know, they weren't able to shift it entirely. Um, that I think that's one side to the coin, is just understanding this and looking at this and how it operates through time. And of course, the Sikh Empire then comes at a really important turning point in that history. Um, the other side of it, I think, is thinking about, you know, in terms of today's popular culture and that kind of thing, what do iconic figures like Ranjit Singh or Jind Gaur or Dilip Singh mean mm. in terms of more popular understandings of, you know, reclaiming um, a history of an independent Sikh Raj. Uh, like, I mean, today, you know, we're seeing lots of Sikh farmers protesting in Delhi and slogans about Khalsa Raj and Sikh Raj are constantly coming up. Um, and so, you know, and it's interesting because then Ranjit Singh as a figure is, is sometimes a bit, you know, it's interesting. I uh, talk about it again in the first chapter. He's, some Sikh scholars were uncomfortable with his position as a monarch. Whereas others, of course, uphold him as this hero that we, we should never forget and that we should seek to, you know, reclaim and establish that Khalsa Raj again. Um, so it's, and that's why I wanted to get to the heart of, you know, actually putting that question out there back at readers to say, well, you know, why do we have such a messy, complicated understanding of what it meant to be a Sikh king? And, you know, and I, t- I only can't only go into it in so much depth in the book, but I want to spur a debate about that really, um, particularly because I'm seeing, you know, the names of Ranjit Singh, um, Jindagore, Dalip Singh being invoked more and more, especially in a context of, you know, today's debates about decolonizing and particularly in the in the diaspora, that we maybe reclaim lost kingdoms, lost um, political entities as a way to, you know, recover a more powerful history as opposed to the impact of British colonial rhetoric. But there's only so far you can go with that as well. I mean, I'm talking about a Sikh empire as well. It's not like Kashmiris on the on the border of Punjabi rule were happy about Ranjit Singh taking over. So where do you go with this, right? Yeah. And I think, yeah, so if only to investigate the layers and the meanings and mm-hmm. the impacts of these histories, I think mm-hmm. royal history actually needs, it's helpful to bring it back to the foreground mm-hmm. so that we know, we have a deeper understanding of the terms that we're using in today's debates about history and about power and empire and that kind of thing. Yes, and I think empire, to, to emphasize that royalty always also has to do with empire and to give our understandings of empire um, rather greater nuance than we have at the moment. You know, when we think of empire at the moment, we think of very specific kinds of hugely exploitative uh, metropolitan centric um, European empires and of course those were by no means um, you know those simply represented a particular model of empire um, that, that was in, in very many ways not at all typical um, in, in the sort of long history of empire um, in, in, in uh, over, over human history um, so so it's also a rescue of histories of empire as, as well as a rescue of histories of royalty I think. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I referenced that exactly in the book. I talk about Ranjit Singh and his family engaging in a form of dynastic colonialism. Yes, I, my, my antenna went off. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> That's not a term that I coined yeah, yes. myself, but one that I borrowed from sort of, you know, global early modern European history. So it's, mm-hmm. it's thinking about all of these things, you know, and their connections. We've been talking about all through this thing, but absolutely, you know, empire had so many different meanings. Um, and I, it's just, um, I'm hoping that the book can add to that conversation, really. Which it does, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm you. reminded of, um, uh, you know, my maternal grandmother used to, um, uh, at the time I was embarrassed by this, refer to Queen Victoria as a sati, as a sati rani, you know, as a it's kind of, I guess she met, she was referring to Prince Albert and the mourning for Prince Albert. Uh, so there's a kind of Indianization of the British monarchy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I soon came to see that it was not uncommon because of course, from 1858 onwards, the Queen's proclamation was referred to assiduously and insistently by Indians from all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, 
uh, as a charter of their freedom against the British state, uh, you know, so that it, it, their freedoms had to be claimed through the language of royalty and through the person of Queen Victoria, who was seen as being as it were, their ally, uh, or at least the author of this proclamation. And, and, you know, clearly the government of India never liked this because they didn't think that the Queen's proclamation was, had the force of law in that sense. Uh, so there's the interesting story to be told how the figure of, the, of royalty and of sovereignty uh, actually comes very early on to define Indian freedoms and not uh, Indian, as it were, slavery. Uh, and, you know, from what you and Polly have been saying, of course, it's also striking how when India does become independent, how the, the return simply by the fact of becoming a sovereign nation state, the language of royalty comes back uh, mm -hmm. in these in the usages of the word Raj, for instance, in all kinds of ways. Um, and today, if you look at the Indian prime minister himself from a part of the country, which was heavily infested, if you will, by petty and not so petty royal houses, he's treated in Gujarat like a king and he's given the attributes of a king. He's called Sahib, which is what you would call a, a Gujarati prince, a Gujarati monarch. And people bow to him, fellow Gujaratis, including the home minister, touch his feet, etc. And And it doesn't strike anyone as being curious, though you would think that this is not the way that an elected head of government uh, should you know should be treated in a parliamentary democracy? So in a way, you you do see the return of the language and theater, as Polly was saying, of royalty, uh, not as a not as a kind of uh, counterfactual or an, not in an ironic mode necessarily, uh, because it seems to gesture towards the sovereignty of the new nation state um, itself, and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with um, Indian princely order of the colonial period, because uh, certainly the Indian prime minister doesn't come from that kind of background. Mm. So the democratization of the language of royalty is also really uh, extraordinary here. Um, and I don't think, I, I don't think one sees that, I might be mistaken, in Britain uh, or in other European countries, uh, the democratization of royalty and the attributes of royalty. Uh, maybe you see it in pop culture, uh, you know, with rock, rock and roll singers and things like that, and mm -hmm. celebrity culture. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, you know, the tenacity of that, I think, is really striking. Yeah, definitely. I wonder if um, from the present darkness, I'll turn my uh, video on as well. I might come back in again here just to... Um, help us along with a number of questions for the last five ten minutes or so i'm really i've enormously enjoyed this uh discussion and there are i've actually had one or two questions sent to me directly so people haven't just put them in the the, the q a um <clears throat> uh, but i'd like to start with uh, by introducing i'm in french studies i'm an early modernist um but i thought i might introduce a little bit of french theory to the discussion and see where we go with it because it seems to me that one of the things that you've all variously been talking about is a combination of what the Sarto calls poaching, where the subaltern kind of takes on the the the, the stuff, the theatre, the, the 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 props of the more powerful, and then repurposes them for their own uh, for their own liberation and or the consolidation of their own power. So poaching on one hand, and on the other hand, obviously there's the famous notion of bricolage that um, the um, anthropologists Levi Strauss and others came up with, where again, you take various different parts of a, an existing, uh, possibly foreign culture and see where the connections are with your own. Um, am I being too French theorist here or is this connecting to, to what you've been doing Priya at all in, in your work? No, definitely. I mean, Ranjit's not, I mean, it, he directly recruited French generals um, a bit later than I think believe your period was, but, um, you know, former, former employees of Napoleon and had them refashion his army mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then use that essentially to completely revolutionize uh, the former Sikh, Sikh military tradition that had been around since the time of Guru Gobind Singh, which was predominantly cavalry warfare, quite guerrilla based, mm -hmm. to, to help him build, consolidate a state underneath him and, and, and then a state-led, state-controlled army. Mm -hmm. um, alongside, you know, 
taking inspiration from Mughal history and, and literature that he collected, picking up ideas from, from company officers and, and sort of more European influences that were, of course, well entrenched in the subcontinent by that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and actually creating a very cosmopolitan court and a government and an administration mm-hmm. um, that was not just led by sick officers and you know uh, chiefs and that kind of thing, but who had, of course, risen from quite a subaltern background to become like this noble class over the mm-hmm. course of the 18th century, mm-hmm. um, to also encourage other types of, I suppose, parvenu um, elites that he brought up through his own um, encouragement and passionage and that kind of stuff that came from you know, m- Muslim intellectual families, merchant families, but also Hindu uh, trading classes and, and others, the uh, Dogra, Rajput, different ethnic clans. Mm-hmm. Um, so it really was a patchwork mm-hmm. society and a patchwork administration in, in that respect. Right. And that was one of its strengths, because, of course, the Punjab is a multi-ethnic, multi-faith, you know, massive massively important region and culturally very diverse mm-hmm. um and, and and that also reflected in his dynasty him marrying women from throughout the region and of, again of different faith and social backgrounds mm-hmm. um and i don't think he was a uh, unique in doing that i think there were many other indian kingdoms who were doing it but it was interesting how particularly successful he was and how much that helped that network of people helped to stabilize this kingdom yeah. in otherwise quite a turbulent period Thank you. Um, another question has to do with one of the, again, guiding threads through your discussion, um, which is the question of gender and the degree of agency that women had in this in this world. Um, and one question that has been sent to me by by email, and I'm not sure why they did it like this, but anyway, they did, um, <laughs> which is, um, in, Polly, in your response, you seem to have um, suggested that there are sort of new ways of thinking about what you, the last of your three things, so 18th century culture, sick culture in particular, and then thirdly, cultures of gender, that there may be ways of rethinking the sort of history of gender here. The question says, but do we always have to do it in relation to the family? Um, in other words, is women's agency only ever a function of a position in relation to a family uh, in this period? Is there any other, I mean, there must be women in this time who are not related to families, but uh, do we have to think women's history in relation to the history of the family? That's a question either for Polly or for Priya or indeed for Fazl if he has anything to say on that matter. Um, well, I mean, um, uh, I think it's, you know, I I think I appreciate the, the question behind it, which is, you know, can women not be agents, you know, in their own right kind of thing? Yep. Um, uh, and I wonder whether that's actually a very uh, immediately a very useful question. I mean, from my perspective, um, uh, in the South Asian setting, the family, uh, for almost all women, not all women, but for almost all women, the family is um, the terrain on which women have to negotiate their life chances, their access to resources, their access to key life stages, the shaping of key life stages, um, their, their um, access to all sorts of other things like education, um, employment opportunities, and so on. So I don't think it's I don't think it's any diminution of women's uh, ability to act as agents to say that very often we have to situate it within the family. It's recognizing that that is where women exercise their agency. Mm-hmm. That is where they do it. Um, mm-hmm. uh, um, to say that they do it within the family isn't to diminish that agency. If anything, it's to emphasize the creativity, the imagination, the determination with, with which so many women, that uh, historical women that we know about, went about making lives for themselves and developing strategies of, for, for realizing some degree of autonomy within the family. Um, uh, and the other reason I think that the emphasis on the family is so important is that it brings gender right back to the center of the historical enterprise. Because if you're t- once you appreciate how critical um, the family is to so many uh, political, social um, uh, 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 process, cultural processes in this period, we then we then can't talk about politics or anything else without understanding, without seeing the connection, the presence there of gender. Um, so 
it's rather a long answer. Priya, you will have No, I, I couldn't have put any better myself. I think it, that's it. I think it's crucial to, to recognise just how important the family and the dynasty is as a political formation, particularly in, whether it's particularly in South Asia or not, but yeah, it's, it's crucial to the, to the operation of politics and therefore to see women as leading players within that and, mm. and, how, and how that in turn shapes the broader dynamics of, of a state. You know, that the family and the state are not separate entities then. No, no, exactly. They're totally connected. And so therefore it's crucial that you understand how they operate. So it's, you know, and then what that means, essentially you cannot divorce the gender aspect or the female aspect from this if you, if you look at it in its mm. whole and mm. complete terms. Yeah. I'm sure that's not only to do with South Asia. I mean, if we look at what's happening today in the US, there's one family leaving. <laughs> Um, for example. Uh, so I think there is, yeah, it's really not only about women and family, it's about politics and family, as you say, but uh, yeah. Um, we've got time for one more question, if I may, and that's another one that's come, which is, uh, Priya, this is the fruition of a long ongoing project for you. Now that it's found its final form, where's your research taking you next? And does it build on Royals and Rebels, or does it go somewhere entirely new? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> I've, I've had a little break recently, uh, but I am starting to think about the next project. And um, it's taking shape slowly. It doesn't help the libraries and archives and things are closed right now. Um, but I think it's it's going to be very much building on on the work, the second half of my doctoral thesis, which which looked at many of the things we were discussing today uh, regarding Deep Singh and Queen Victoria. And, and really then taking this question about the dynamics of royal power to Britain. And, and looking at Dilip Singh in exile and what he represented as this, you know, iconic figure, but also, um, you know, his lived experiences and his, what we, I guess what we can see through his story, standing on his shoulders and going into the court of Queen Victoria or into British aristocratic society or into rebellion with him, um, kind of a window into the world of how monarchy and royal power and empire were all again evolving during the course of the second half of the 19th century. And, you know, Faisal and I again discussed this from the 1857 as one last gasp, perhaps, or one new beginning for, for Indian royalty, all the way up to the beginnings of the 20th century, where okay, again, royalty will take on another um, challenge with, with the, the switch to World War I. Um, and what that, you know, with, with the rise of republics and democratic nation states and, and you know, the, the shift for British empire at that point, um, when Dilip Singh gets involved in kind of anti-colonial politics. So I kind of, I'm thinking of a biography that will encapsulate some of these strands that will use his life as a, as a very much a window into all of that turbulence for, for monarchy, but, but also the lingering effects of, you know, we, they still haven't gone away, have they, the royal family or, <laughs> or anybody else. Um, so thinking about that through the lens of class and power and race and all those kind of aspects too. Mm -hmm. Well, Thank you for a, a full answer to that. And hopefully in however many years it takes, we can invite you back again and, and re, re, rerun this discussion with, with, the, with the new book. Um, thank you all three of you for a really brilliant discussion. Um, I think it's been enormously enjoyable and also enormously informative. So um, much, much food for thought. Thank you too uh, for those watching, for those contributing questions um, and just joining in by listening. Please join us again at the same time in two weeks for our next Book at Lunchtime event on Wednesday the 3rd of February, where we'll be discussing uh, the political life of an epidemic, cholera crisis and citizenship in Zimbabwe by Professor Simakai Chigudu. Check the Torch website to register for next week's event. Uh, once again, thank you to all three of you for today um, and goodbye. <laughs>